I don't know how to sing this song, so I need you guys to sing it a little louder. Amen. I'm serious. <laughs> Predestination, O oh, Glorious and Happy Doctrine. Uh, the reason why I did that is because there's usually a lot of unrest when it comes to talking about the doctrine of predestination. Uh, there's a, there's a uneasiness when we talk about what God does in eternity past and what he decrees and, and this teaching on election and who God chooses uh, does stir up the passions quite a bit. I know for this preacher it certainly did for many, many years, and other preachers as well. But it is Bible doctrine, and I am committed to preaching the whole counsel of God's Word, and that is what I'm committed to doing tonight, to preach the whole counsel of God's Word. The sermon will be an overview of predestination. I'm going to cover some tough stuff tonight, no doubt, uh, but I do want to spend some time on the specific areas where predestination is mentioned in covering context, what that means. I firmly believe, because I've come to this conclusion myself, that once you study this doctrine, understand it, and apply it, you will be greatly encouraged Amen. by what you're learning from it. Um, it is not meant to put fear in the hearts and minds of God's people at all. Uh, this is a doctrine that was certainly prevalent throughout church history. It's not something new. I'm going to cover that in a little bit. Not new. I, I can't stress that enough. It's not new. It is throughout, seen throughout church history. I'm not going to have all the documentation here tonight, uh, but I have some material at home, and I'll incorporate that in future sermons on it. I'm currently reading a book on the Great Awakening, the first Great Awakening, a very uh, significant time period in our nation's history. And many of you know the names I'm about to mention. Uh, Jonathan Edwards, for example. Uh, most of you know Jonathan Edwards. Uh, John was kind enough last year to print up like 20 copies of Sinners in the Hands of an Angry God. Jonathan Edwards was a Calvinist. You just, that need, you need to face that reality. He was a Calvinist. He was a predestinarian. And so he believed in the doctrine of predestination. Many, many souls were saved under his preaching. And it would tie into that George Whitfield. He's another one. And he was a predestinarian. Many souls, many, many souls were saved under his preaching. 
And then we, we transition into my favorite, uh, the Second Great Awakening. And this is where I believe there was a great divide. This was between Charles Grandison Finney, clearly an Arminian, and as a held Nettleton, clearly a Calvinist or predestinarian in his theology. Things changed in the church from that point on. Things significantly changed. What was that change? What, was, what caused that? What was the catalyst that put things on a different course in today's churches? And I believe getting away from these core doctrines is what put churches today on that course. Easy believism. That's one of the most damaging things to the body of Christ today. Easy believism. There must be a work of the Spirit in the hearts first. There must be regeneration. You must be born again. That is clearly taught in Scripture. Clearly taught in Scripture. Uh, you cannot escape that. And I think that a lot of churches want to get, as did Finney, to get away from teaching on the doctrine of regeneration. I've talked about it in the church many, 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 many times. You become a new creature in Christ. There's a work of the Spirit in those souls that are dead. Ephesians chapter 2. You're dead in trespasses and sins. In fact, the verse goes, you who he has quickened, who are dead in trespasses and sins. That's a spiritual work in hearts that are naturally bound towards rebellion and sin and our enmity against God. And so let's look at a couple of these verses that we're, I'm just going to go through them real quick. I'm not going to expound on them to any great degree. Uh, let's start with Romans chapter 8. Romans chapter 8 and verse number 28 is where we'll start. I know most of you probably already have that verse memorized. And Paul saying to this church, And we know that all things work together for good to them that love God, to them who are the called according to his purpose. Notice verse 29. For whom he did foreknow, he also did predestinate to be conformed to the image of his Son, that he might be the firstborn among many brethren. Moreover, whom he did predestinate, them he also called. And whom he called, them he also justified. And whom he justified, them he also glorified. The comfort that we find in this verse, not only with the calling aspect of it, but with the end result that we see happening here in this verse, we are predestinated by God to be conformed to the image of the Son. There is a, there's a, a work of the Spirit and sanctification in our lives now. Someday, ultimately, we are going to be conformed to the Son physically and spiritually. All the things that plague our bodies now and our spirits now will be done away with. And I will expound on this more at another point in time. I didn't want to uh, go into detail on it. But let's turn to the next one, Ephesians chapter 1. Ephesians chapter 1, a book that I hope to be in this summer, in our Sunday morning service. And from what I understand, there's quite a few people here that really do like the book of Ephesians, so Amen. that's going to fit well. Amen. Verse number 2, grace be to you and peace from God our Father. And from the Lord Jesus Christ, blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who hath blessed us with all spiritual blessings in heavenly places in Christ, according as, no verse 4, according as he hath chosen us in him before the foundation of the world. Before he's chosen us. There's election, verse number 4. That's what it is. Before the foundation of the world that we should be holy and without blame before him in love. <coughs> Having predestinated us unto the adoption of children by Jesus Christ to himself according to the good pleasure of his will. And then we, look, we, get, we jump ahead to verse number 11. In whom also we have obtained an inheritance being predestinated according to the purpose of him who worketh all things after the counsel of his own will. Now I can 
probably give a good guess right now. Some people are probably looking at those verses a little bit differently and thinking, wow, that's, that's really challenging right there. I'm looking at some things that are uh, really waking me up right now. God does everything in my life after his will. And you might be going through some things in your life. You might be getting some challenging things come your way and think, my goodness, God is purposing all these things in my life. To what end? Here's the reality of it. Here's the part that we struggle with. He does all things for his own honor and glory. Amen. Amen. And, 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 and let me say this, and I'll add to it, even your suffering is for his honor and glory. That's tough. I'll admit it, that's tough. But see, even in our suffering, we can draw on the grace and strength of God Amen. and give him praise for the strength and grace that he's given us to endure through that trial. Amen. We look at predestination and election, we see great comfort in that as well because we know how the end is. We know what the results are going to be. I mean, this whole thing could blow up on Monday. I mean, everybody's talking about the eclipse, right? You know, the, the world's going to melt, it's going to split in half, we're going to have earthquakes. I mean, there's all kinds of craziness that's going on. All right, whatever. It doesn't matter because I know that God has it under control because God is overall and God is sovereign. Amen. All right, let's turn to one more, Second Peter chapter 3. We'll get to the intro in a minute. And I, I chose this, this text of scripture in Peter to segue into the sermon tonight because there are things in the Bible that are difficult to understand. And I want to say tonight as your pastor that that's okay. It's okay to encounter things in the Bible that we don't understand. What I've found, in, particularly with this doctrine, of all, I've been doing this for three, four years now, presenting a doctrinal practical thing. And this doctrine has raised more questions and more discussions and gotten more people into the Bible than anything else that I have mentioned up to this point so far. And I will say this, all of the discussions have been profitable. They've been encouraging to me. And I will say this in addition, there are different levels of understanding in terms of this doctrine. And I will say, that's okay. That's okay, there's nothing wrong with that. It's okay not to understand, it's okay to be confused. That's why we study the Bible. That's why we have preachers and teachers. That's why we pray. That's why we look these things up and ponder these things. God puts these things in here. They're meant to be an encouragement to us. They're meant to, to, to give us that, that assurance that no matter what happens in our life, these, this is the determined outcome by our God. And he cannot and will not fail. Whether you're, in regardless of what side you're on in this big debate, the outcome is assured. So if you're if you're of the camp where you can lose your salvation and 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 all, the outcome is assured. If you are genuinely saved, whether you believe it or not, you're going to be going to heaven. If there's been truly regeneration, you're going. And so the the outcome is there. But anyway, let's read on verse fifteen. Um, uh, actually, I'll start with verse 14. Wherefore, beloved, seeing that ye look for such things, be diligent that ye may be found of him in peace without spot and blameless. And account that the long suffering of our Lord is salvation, even as our beloved brother Paul, also according to the wisdom given unto him, hath written unto you, as also in all his epistles, speaking in them of these things, in which are some things hard to be understood. There are things in the Bible that are hard to understand. Stick around sometime when we're talking about eschatology. That's the other one that's raised a lot of discussion. And that's okay. It's raised discussion. It's got people in the Bible. That's what's important. Be a Berean. Search the scriptures, right? Which they that are unlearned and unstable rest as they do also the other scriptures unto their own destruction. So the first part of that verse is what I wanted to draw your attention to. There are things in the Bible that are hard to understand. The thing I struggled with in this particular doctrine um, is because it was hard to understand, you want to make changes to it. You want to shift it around. You want It's got to mean something else. It can't possibly mean that. We've got to embrace something else. There's no way that God will do that. 
But then again, think about it. Could God punish anybody in hell? Absolutely. But the world says that's unjust and that's unfair. Well, think about this. None of us deserve to be saved. None of us do. But we, we, we look at that like, we look at God like he owes us something. And God doesn't owe any of us anything. And so in light of that, when we look at it, we say, wow, grace. I deserved wrath. I deserved hell. I deserved condemnation. And God saved me. And he saved you. So now grace takes on a whole different meaning. Amen? Amen. All right. So this subject... I preached on a couple years back. I actually went into my notes and I found it. And then I also covered it to some degree in the systematic theology that I taught. In soteriology, um, I covered uh, predestination. So it was just an overview or an introduction. It, I, it did, wasn't a, a detailed study at all. So it was very limited in scope on both occasions. And it didn't really raise, I was surprised, it didn't really raise a lot of discussion. But this year... We are focusing on the doctrine of predestination, the doctrinal theme for the year, and the discussions have been abundant, and they've all been extremely profitable. And folks are taking time to learn this doctrine. Whether they agree with my position on it or not, that's not a judgment. What matters is that people are open to learning and studying this doctrine. Now. As I was preparing the lessons, or the, this sermon, I learned that Jonathan Edwards, the great first Great Awakening evangelist, the author of the famous sermon, Sinners in the Hands of an Angry God, and I quote, once wrestled with what he views as a horrible doctrine. Jonathan Edwards was certainly no slouch. Brilliant man, great evangelist. Many, many, many souls were saved under his preaching. But the quote goes on to say, later, he became fully satisfied with it and found himself overwhelmed with the sweet beauty of the king eternal, end quote. The ultimate question that comes to mind when we think about this is the initiative. The initiative either lies with God, that would be the Protestant or Reformed view, or man. And that is completely on the part of man. Man takes the initiative, God doesn't. The problem is man is dead in sin. Romans 3 deals with this issue. They don't seek after God. There are none righteous. There are none that seeketh after God. All have sinned and come short of the glory of God. There is no fear of God before their eyes. Ephesians chapter 2 says they are dead in trespasses of sin. Man in his natural state is not seeking after God. If you look back on your testimony, you will see that God was seeking after you. Somebody sent an evangelist your way. Somebody sent a soul winner your way. You came across a Bible or a gospel tract, and the Spirit of God dealt with your soul where you were at. You became convinced and convicted of your sin and your rebellion before God and your need for grace. And through that marvelous, gracious, profound work of the Spirit, you cried upon Jesus Christ and received Him as your Savior. You were born again, sanctified and justified, adopted into the family of God. To quote the verses I referenced, predestined to be conformed to the image of the Son. Predestined to the adoption to Him. But unfortunately, there's a lot of tension today. So there's basically only two options, limited atonement or universal. And I would say this, I'm not a universalist. I'm not a universalist. I've never been a universalist. I don't see a universalist being in the Bible at all. And so as a result, there's tension. There's tension between the Calvinistic views, or the implications of the doctrine, and because of the Calvinistic implications, People don't want to preach on it. They don't want to talk about it. They don't want to bring it up. And if they do, and I talk to preachers, well, we avoid that because of the Calvinistic implications. That's no way to preach and approach the Bible. You go to Romans 9. Oh, skip Romans 9. I mean, Jesus, uh, Jacob I loved, and Esau I hated. This is while they were in the womb, by the way. You know how many times I read through that chapter and saw that? 
can't possibly mean that. The implication is, no, 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 it can't be. There's got to be something else. What does it say? This is, the, this, is, this is the approach that we take to these precious scriptures. And then we put it off to the side because of this implication. Or we rework it to blunt the sharp edge of its obvious teaching. I want to quote to you from the Canons of Dort. This is 1618, 1619. It was a great debate. Jacob Arminius had come on the scene to try to suppress the Calvinistic preaching that was going on in the churches. And so as a response to the Armenian influence, to try to suppress this, the canons of Dort, or the synod, I should say, the synod of Dort, uh, took place to define what these doctrines were and what their um, importance was. And I'm going to just quote a portion of it here on predestination. It said this, and I quote, The doctrine of predestination can be misunderstood, misapplied, and misrepresented by men of perverse, impure, and unstable minds. Should preachers therefore set aside the doctrine and give it no place in their sermons, that would be a great loss to God's people. To holy and pious souls, this affords unspeakable consolation. End quote. We are quick Unfortunately, to lump doctrines like election and predestination, even eternal wrath. I'll take a few moments to talk about that so you understand the point that I'm coming from. Are not churches today avoiding the doctrine of hell? Of course they are. I think most of you know that. Don't preach on hell. Why? Because people are offended. They're uncomfortable. It creates unease. Did you ever listen to the CD that Sean, uh, Sean, John um, produced by Jonathan Edwards? I'll have John make some more and bring him in. Put it in your car and listen to it. He didn't hold back. He preached the full counsel of God. And those people in Northampton, in that church, and this was a script that he read, they were climbing up on their pews. They thought the flames of hell were reaching through the floor grabbing a hold of them and pulling them down. There was a great revival as a result of that preaching. And we see churches systematically today getting away from all of these historic doctrines and um, teachings. Churches slipping away more and more and more. And that's just one example. That's just one example. And so what we want to do is be careful that we don't lump these and doctrines into a basket and call it Calvinism. I was having a conversation with somebody, I think it was Jeff, and he said, you know, I'm just sick and tired of all the isms. Let's just learn from the Bible. I agree. I agree. Let's learn from the Bible. Because believe me, there are things about Calvinist, Calvinist, uh, Calvin's teaching that I don't agree with. So we need to be careful with false statements from the pulpit um, with regards to these things. And I certainly have made my fair share of them from the pulpit. And for the record, John Calvin did not invent predestination. He did no more invent uh, predestination than Martin Luther invented justification. Or for our Amil friends, no more than Darby invented dispensationalism. I was trying to be funny, but it didn't work. <laughs> Believe it or not, John Calvin's main point. You, you ready for John Calvin's emphasis? I'm going to tell you what it was. It was the work of the Holy Spirit and salvation. I think everybody here would agree with that. The work of the Holy Spirit and salvation. That's what we pray for, is it not? Do we not pray for the work of the Spirit in the hearts of those that are lost? I do. That's what we're asking. So we're debating this subject on this, but it truly is a work of God. It truly is a work of the Spirit. It's a drawing of the sinner. It is the prayed lost saint to Christ. Beautiful. And that was his focus. That's referenced by Warfield, uh, John Calvin, the theologian. And so, uh, as I stated earlier, I don't 
look at predestination as a Calvinistic doctrine. Um, I don't even know if I would call it reform doctrine, but I think to separate from all the other strange, peculiar views on it, I, I would hold to that, the reform doctrine. Um, they do have a, a view on it that I believe is biblical, but I, I wouldn't refer to it as that, just the biblical doctrine of predestination, the Bible doctrine of it. So my stand is this. I adhere to Christ, first and foremost. I trust in Scripture alone. I trust in the revelation of the Spirit, not in special knowledge or special revelation, not in my own personal bias, nor of man. And I will not, to the best of my ability, advocate for a man-centered, works-based doctrine. I won't do it. There's too many of those out there today. Too many people are trying to earn their way into heaven if they're just good enough, if they just clean themselves up enough, if they just get right enough, if they just get closer to the will of God and the holiness of God and, and get closer to the favor of God, then they'll go to heaven. That's not it at all. We have nothing of worth or value. It's purely by grace. The beauties of grace. And so, uh, an in-depth study of this doctrine, which future lessons will cover, puts the cause, that is to say, the chosen or election by the Holy Spirit, and the effect, that's predestination, which I covered earlier, the predestined to adoption, predestined to be conformed to the image of the Son. It puts all of this squarely on the grace and power of Almighty God. One of the things I've read, and I've used this argument before, and I've heard it. Pastor Tim, it's just like you're drowning, right? Some of you probably heard this. Pastor Tim, you're, you're drowning. You're out there. There's no help. And, 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 and the guy throws you the life preserver. And all you've got to do is reach for that life preserver, and you'll be saved. The problem with that is, picture that guy out there drowning dead and throwing the life preserver. See, the scripture says you are dead in trespasses and sins. And a dead person can't grab a life preserver. Amen. So what does that do for grace? Amen. Ratchets up another notch, doesn't it? Amen. It's all of grace. It's all of God. Amen. Isn't that wonderful? Amen. I know too many are very uncomfortable with this subject. And it does raise the pulse rate. And it's certainly not my intention to do that. But I do want you to think about how lucky and fortunate and blessed you are to be a child of God. Amen. And the gospel does go out to all. I want to read to you real quick. We're going to root. This is what does predestination mean. It's under this section. I know we're running out of time. But um, I want to read to you the six, a portion of the 1689 Confession. I've got a number of definitions. That's just one. And this is what it says, and I quote, The doctrine of the high mystery of predestination is to be handled with special prudence and care. That men attending the will of God revealed in his word and yielding obedience thereunto may, from the certainty of their effectual vocation, be assured of their eternal election. So shall this doctrine afford matter of praise, reverence, and admiration of God, and humility, diligence, and ready, and abundant consolation to all that sincerely obey the gospel. There's your whosoever will, for those of you that are in that category. There's your whosoever will. Let's go for the reference Bible on Ephesians 1.5. Predestination is that effective exercise of the will of God by which things before determined by him are brought to pass, end quote. Webster's, I think we have it up there in a to predetermine or foreordain, to appoint or ordain beforehand by an unchangeable purpose. It means to pre, uh, to determine beforehand or to declare beforehand. Uh, let's turn to Isaiah 14. I have a couple of texts we're going to turn to. Isaiah 14. <clears throat> Verse 24, the Lord of hosts hath sworn, saying, Surely as I have thought, 
so shall it come to pass, and as I have a purpose, and as I have purpose, so shall it stand, that I will break the Assyrian in my land, and upon my mountains tread him under my foot. Then shall his yoke depart from off them, and his burden depart from off their shoulders. This is the purpose that is purposed upon the whole earth, and this is the hand that is stretched out upon all nations. For the Lord of hosts hath purposed, and who shall disannul it? And his hand is stretched out, and who shall turn it back? If the Lord has purposed it, who shall disannul it? Disannul it. If you are a child of God, if you have been born again, God's end purpose for you and for me will come to pass. Amen. The question of whether or not you can maintain to the end should be stricken from your mind and thoughts. It will come to pass. I love that text because I think of Jesus Christ. No man shall pluck the sheep from my hand. Amen. He that has begun a good work in you will perform it till the day of Jesus Christ. Amen. And many other texts that support this. The adversary is not going to take your salvation from you. Not all the powers of hell are going to take the salvation of Christ from you. That gift of eternal life. That is as secure as is the sovereignty and holiness of of God. Amen. Amen? Amen. Martin Lloyd Jones said the difference between the two is the difference between the plan, the thing determined, and the execution of it. Predestination is not double predestination, where God determines to send some of purposes or predestines some to eternal damnation. There is no scripture that supports that teaching. And what are some common misconceptions about reformed predestinarians? And these can easily be shown to be false. History and personal testimony uh, can support this. Number one, Reformed predestinarians don't evangelize. I can't tell you how many times I've said that myself. Calvinists don't evangelize. I have learned the hard way, time and time again, that is simply not true. I quoted to you Jonathan Edwards, George Whitfield, as a Hill Nettleton. We have met Calvinistic evangelists in our outreach, very, very capable of sharing the gospel of Christ. Spurgeon, he was not only a top preacher, I think everybody in this building tonight knows who Spurgeon is and has to some degree read something by Spurgeon. Maybe his morning and evening devotionals, maybe the treasury of David, maybe a tract by Spurgeon. He's, a, he's a, the, 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 the chief soul winning. He wrote a book on soul winning. Every sermon he preached, it, it headed to the cross of Christ. His appeal was made time after time after time for souls to repent and get right with God and be born again. Jonathan Edwards wrote tracts that enhanced the spiritual revival in Connecticut. I've heard it, but predestinarians don't do missions. Will you carry? was a Calvinist. Most of you know who William Carey is. He's the poster child for missions. Reformed predestinarians don't believe the elect are saved before they are saved. Let me say this tonight for those that might think, well, they don't have to say or pray or anything. You are called. All men are called everywhere to do what? To repent. Amen. Nobody's exempt from that. All are called. The gospel is to go out to all. And this is another one that I heard. The, the predestinarians boast in their election. Oh, you're one of those Calvinists. You boast in your election. I've never met one. But I've met some Armenians that do a lot of bragging. So I would be careful when you throw those stones because it works both ways, folks. None of us, whatever side of the aisle you're on, nobody has any right to brag about anything. Grace is grace. None of us have a right to brag. We need to keep ourselves in check on that. Um, as far as the double predestination, I just want to do a follow-up 
quote here, and then we'll move on to the next po uh, point. The larger body of Reformed folks do not believe in or hold to a double predestination. And this is what the quote goes on to say. The condemnation of sinners is never purely sovereign. It's judicial. It's judicial. It's justice. Man is not condemned on the ground that he's not elected, on the ground of his being predestined to perdition. He is condemned because he is a sinner, because he is unjust before God. That is why. And so we think about that moving on to the next point. Why preach on it? So now probably a lot of folks are thinking about this. Okay, there's some good parts to this, and there's some challenging parts to this. Why should we preach on it? Why should your pastor preach on it? Should it be avoided at all costs because of the implications? Because of the controversy surrounding it? Or relegated to a doctrine of non-importance? Let me ask you this. At what point do we stop relegating doctrines to non-importance for the sake of keeping peace with people? To satisfy people uh, not offending people or upsetting people by what we preach. At what point do we draw the line? So this is upsetting to some people. Okay, so we pitch that to the side. Oh, Pastor Tim is preaching on hellfire and condemnation. That's offensive to people. You should ease up on that, Pastor. You're going to scare people out of the church. I know, brother. I, I'm, I'm, I'm endeavoring, and I, you know, I spend my time studying the First and Second Great Awakening, and these doctrines were preached with force. And great changes took place in the hearts of, we're talking genuine change. Like people gripped with fear before Almighty God, grieving, grieving over their sin. When was the last time you grieved over your sin? When was the last time you fell to your knees before a holy God Pleading, God, forgive me for my sin and my rebellion. These are the things of revival. These are the things of an awakening. The souls of men coming alive. Seeing their perilous condition. And longing to get right with God. When I did my study on Azahel Nettleton, he grew up in, a, um, in the Presbyterian Tradition. So he learned the Westminster Confession. His parents taught it to him as a catechism. But he went on his his path and life of rebellion. And then right around 17, 18 years old, he began to question things and question the Bible and question hell and all this stuff that so many question today. And then he heard a sermon preached by an evangelist that gripped his soul. <clears throat> He was gripped with fear before God. He was, he was overtaken with the, the immensity of his sin and his offense before God. He wanted to, to get right with God and he knew the only thing that he could do to get right with God was to cry unto God and he was gloriously saved as a result of it. And his ministry as an evangelist led to 60,000 souls getting saved. And I will say this in comparison to Finney. A lot of Finney's so-called converts ended up leaving the church altogether. Sound familiar? They checked on Azahel Nettleton's converts years later, and many of them were still going to church and serving. See, there's something to be said about a genuine conversion that takes place. And so we talk about why preaching on it. A couple of things I wanted to mention here. We're talking about the mystery. There's a couple of different ways that people approach mystery. Uh, they approach it from a, a revealed perspective, and I, I could agree with that, but there's also a mystery aspect of it. And when I study this doctrine, I've studied far greater men than, than I am and I will ever be who said it's a, it's a mystery. There are, there are challenges to understanding this or nuances to this that I just can't understand. And let me say this to you tonight, folks. It's okay if there are things that you don't understand. It's okay. That's part of the growing process as Christians to struggle with these challenges in our life, these doctrines that you know we are face to face with when we read our own Bibles. First Timothy three sixteen is a classic example, and without controversy, great is the mystery of godliness. God who is manifest in the flesh. 
we would all acknowledge the divinity of Christ to be a great mystery. And I'm sure at some point we've raised questions about the divinity of Christ. And that's okay, because there are things that we don't understand. But we believe it. Amen. Ephesians 1, 9, I quoted earlier, having made known unto us the mystery of his will according to his good pleasure, which he hath purposed in himself. The mystery of his will. Colossians chapter 1, uh, verses 26 and 27. Even the mystery, which hath been hid from ages and from generations, but now is made manifest to the saints, to whom God would make known what is the riches of the glory of this mystery among the Gentiles, which is, you ready for this? Christ in you, hope of glory. Predestination is in the Bible. And it is a doctrinal term that we need to come to terms with to study and to apply in our own lives. Someone said this on being established on sound biblical doctrine. If a church is to grow bigger, it must grow deeper. I like that. Here are some things that predestination does on why we should preach on it. Predestination assures us that our salvation and destiny, that is to say eternal life, are secure. I am secure in the hands of Christ. I'm not going anywhere. Our assurance comes from our understanding of God's will, of his sovereignty, and my favorite aspect of God, or his attribute of God, his immutability. Predestination is all that is associated with our salvation and the life that we are called to live. All of this is grounded in the sovereignty of God. Predestination is a humbling doctrine. It helps us to truly embrace and see how amazing, amazing grace is. Preaching on predestination is for God's glory. And we debate about things plainly spoken of in the scripture for our intellectual satisfaction. We debate about these things because we can't reconcile them. We go against our own reasoning. And we come up with things like God is unjust, God is unfair, God's failed. God makes us into robots. He has not made you into a robot. You know that. That would be a foolish thing to say. I don't want to use a robot. If God made you into a robot, this church would be full. How's that? If God made you into a robot, you wouldn't have sinned at all this week, right? Don't worry. You do have a will, but a will that doesn't supersede the sovereignty of God. When people get nervous, well, I don't have a will, but God determines everything. And No, you have a will and you'll be accountable for it. Those are those tensions in the Bible that I, I've been talking about. Once you start to see those in the Bible, you can't unsee them. And it'll give you great encouragement as well. God hasn't failed. God's not unjust. He's merciful. Amen. Uh, preaching on predestination is for our comfort. This is a precious, precious doctrine that gives us assurance that no matter what happens, we are safe in the arms of Christ and that God's, God's purpose will be fulfilled in our life and overall for the church. And then lastly, I promise this last point, bear with me, I don't want to end here. Biblical examples of God's predestination or election. I'm certainly not going to cover all the scriptures that cover this in the Bible. I'm going to cover some of them, because I think they're important. And we ask this first question, and we'll turn to it in a moment, in Deuteronomy 7. Why did God only choose the Hebrews? Deuteronomy 7. It's one of my favorite texts. It really opened my eyes. Deuteronomy 7. The, the, the question, is that possible? Could God choose somebody just because? I think that's the question. Could, the world says, you know, God loves everybody, and everybody's a child of God, and everybody's going to heaven. That's the false thinking that the world has in that regard. Well, what does the Bible say? Are there examples in the Bible that support what I've been preaching and teaching on up to this moment? Yes, there are. I'm going to read one right now. 
Verse number 7, the Lord did not set his love upon you, nor choose you, because you were more in number than any other people, for you were the fewest of all people, but because the Lord loved you, and because he would keep the oath which he had sworn unto your fathers, hath the Lord brought you out with a mighty hand and redeemed you out of the house of bondage from the hand of Pharaoh, the king of Egypt. Chose you because he loved you. God commended his love toward us in that while we were what? Yet sinners. Yet sinners. And Christ died for us. Isn't that remarkable? Yeah. Now, of all the nations, God chose the Hebrews. He chose the Hebrews to fulfill his plan, his redemptive plan, which, by the way, we're embracing because we're safe now. Amen. Isn't that wonderful? Uh, Deuteronomy 10. We'll go through this kind of quick. I know we're running out of time, but. And it just kind of supports Deuteronomy 7. Only the Lord had a delight in thy fathers to love them, and he chose their seed after them, even you above all people, as it is this day. And I know I'm going kind of quick. That was Hebrew, uh, Deuteronomy 10, 15. Let's jump over to Romans 9. Romans 9. And I'll begin in verse number 7 here. Neither because they are the seed of Abraham, are they all the children, but in Isaac shall they seed be called, that is, they which are the children of the flesh, these are not the children of God, but the children of promise to come with the seed. For this is the word of promise. At this time will I come, and Sarah shall have a son. And not only this, but when Rebekah also had conceived by one, even by our father Isaac, now notice verse number 11, for the children being not yet born, it's in parentheses, supplemental information, neither having done any good or evil that the purpose of God, according to election, <coughs> some would argue, well, that's talking about nations, either way, it's still election, right? Yeah. For election might stand not of works, but of him that calleth. It was said unto her, remember what I read to you from Deuteronomy 7, right? It was said unto her, the elder shall serve the younger. As it is written, Jacob have I loved, but Esau have I hated. Now, I, I guarantee you, somebody's really, their minds are going a mile a minute on this, and that's okay. Study it out. Study it out. <clears throat> Study it up. It's what the text says. Esau have I hated. Hasn't even been born yet. It's already been determined. That's tough. Did God choose you? Let's go to 2 Thessalonians chapter 2. I've already covered this portion of it earlier. I just want to close out with these verses since I took the time to put them in here. Second Thessalonians 2, verse uh, 13. But we are bound, we are bound to give thanks all the way to God for you, brethren, beloved of the Lord, because God hath from the beginning chosen you to salvation through sanctification of the Spirit and belief. You see the tensions again in there? You see that? What does it say? He says he chose you, right? But well, what's the last part of that verse say? Belief. Right? It says that, right, Max? You reading that? You say, somebody said, well, why preach the gospel if God chose before the foundation of the world? Because you're told to. Because everybody needs to hear the gospel of Christ. Right? That's what it says. Give you some things to wrestle with. I don't think anybody's going to sleep tonight. It's all good. John 17, 6 says this, I have manifested thy name unto the men which thou gavest me out of the world. I have manifested thy name unto the men which thou, God, gavest me out of the world. Thine they were, and thou gavest them me, and they have kept thy word. These verses clearly show election. They support the teaching in the Bible. 
I think we should always strive to preach in a way that magnifies the greatness of Almighty God. Amen. And I'll close out with some comments with this question. Is God under the obligation to save anybody? No. no. The answer is obviously no. The only thing that we deserved was wrath and nothing more. I think it was Job that says, What is man that thou art mindful of him? And Job goes on to say, We're nothing but worms. Right? We're nothing but worms. Work, whatever your position is on this, and I know some people have thoughts on it, they have questions, and maybe they doubt it, whatever. And I'm not here to judge anybody. Just trying to teach the Bible doctrine, give a presentation where my, where I stand on it. At the end of the day, the most important thing is, what is the commission to the people of God? And the commission to us all is to preach the gospel to every creature. Predestinarianism, predestination to predestinate, is a doctrine that is seen, has been taught, and believed throughout church history. It is not new. And when we look at the strength of those revivals and awakenings that took place throughout church history, we see these doctrines at the core of the preaching. That is, it's demonstrable just from reading church history. And I'm going to, actually, when I get to one of these again in the future, I'm going to bring in the history of this doctrine and what was taught and believed throughout history. Because a lot of times we make the mistake and we associate these, guarantee some say, that's Calvinist, that's Calvinist, that's, you can't do that. Because you're walking this doctrine into a specific period of time to a man named John Calvin. Mm -hmm. It's historically seen throughout church history, prior to John Calvin, prior to Martin Luther, <coughs> prior to the reformers. A lot of the Baptist heroes of the faith, this is one of the things that really woke me up. Roger Williams, John Clark, Obadiah Holmes, Francis Whalen, all of them, all reformed in their thinking. John Bunyan, that precious soul. I thought you think of the days when I would be so radical against Calvinism and thinking about, you know, how demonic the doctrine was. And those were the things that I was working through in my mind. And then, and then study out the life of John Bunyan. The Pilgrim's Progress, which I recommend here all the time. This is a man that spent 12 years in jail for preaching the gospel of Jesus Christ. His daughter was at home blind, and his wife had no real solid means of, a, I think it was knitting things, to support the family. Just imagine saying something like that from a pulpit with, with that understanding of John Bunyan in the backdrop. The man sacrificed 12 years because of what he believed to be the truth, preaching the gospel. And throughout history, and of course I'm a Baptist and I'll be one until they bury me. And one of the things about being a Baptist, one of the things for me, when you ask me, what is it about being a Baptist? Why? Why is that so important to you? Because Baptists have, throughout history, have always fought for individual soul liberty. And every single one of the great Baptists in America that fought for soul liberty. John Leland, Obadiah Holmes, as I mentioned, John Clark. John Clark and Roger Williams went to England and petitioned King Charles II. Roger Williams came back probably 10 years. I think John Clark stayed an additional two years. And you know, he petitioned him for 12 years. I wanted to think about how serious this individual soul liberty or freedom of religion was to these men. He spent 12 years in England petitioning King Charles II for a, 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 a document that would give them the freedom to worship in church without any government oversight. It was called a lively experiment. It hadn't been done before because the state always controlled the church. Controlled who preached, what was preached. Controlled even how much the minister made. Every aspect. And he came back with this lively experiment and churches were allowed to operate without government oversight. That's why it was called a lively experiment. We have these freedoms that we enjoy right now because of these people, because of what they did and suffered for. All predestinarians. It's remarkable when you read church history and things you learn, isn't it? Really kind of puts you in the right frame of mind. And I hope you're thinking about these freedoms that were 
given to us because people suffered a great deal so that we could come to church and worship without being persecuted. And that's why I think we take it for granted in America. We really do. We take these freedoms for granted. And because we do, we're seeing a decline. I don't have to go to church. It's the attitude today. So that's a terrible attitude. Amen. Terrible. And so anyway, I don't want to keep preaching. It's quarter past seven. So I'll pray and we'll end it out there. Anyway, Father, thank you so much for this night. And thank you for the word. And we just pray that it will find fertile soil in the hearts of you people. I know that it's difficult to understand, difficult to embrace. Uh, Lord, wherever people are at, we just ask that you bless them uh, where they're at, in their thinking, in their hearts. God, help and encourage them as they seek to serve you and to glorify your name. We praise you for all things. We praise you for this great, wonderful gift of salvation. God, help us as we continue to go forward in your name.